Facebook and Twitter, and today we are going to be having conversations about defunding the police or abolishing the police, what that's going to look like. Before we get into that, I'm going to be joined by my host and colleague here at Vice, Alzo Slade. Alzo, welcome. What's happening, brethren? I'm good, man. I'm good. How are you? Welcome back to Brooklyn. <laughs> I appreciate it. So far, so good. You know, these times, I'm just trying to make it one day at a time, bro, one day at a time. So for those of you watching, I'm sure you're familiar with Alzo's work on Vice on H on uh, Showtime, uh, Vice Investigates on Hulu, and Vice News Tonight. Alzo has been doing a lot of great work around the protests in Minneapolis. He also just had uh, an incredible special come out on Sunday called Black South Rising. Alzo, what was it like being in Minneapolis as these demonstrations were rolling out? Um, it was it was pretty surreal. Um, it's interesting because when I came to Vice as to do, you know, correspondent work, I, I said jokingly, but we all know there's much seriousness said in jest. I said that, um, uh, I'm not interested in being a war zone correspondent. So if I had to wear a flak jacket and a helmet, that is not the story for me. You can assign that to someone else. And, um, little did I know that I'd be, um, reporting from a war zone in my very own country in, in Minneapolis in uh, last week. So it's, 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 it's a bit surreal. And I just got back a couple of days ago and hadn't really had a chance to, to process it all. I can only imagine the weight of that experience kind of on your shoulders and having the opportunity to speak with Philando Castile's mom, having the opportunity to engage one-on-one -on -one with those protesters on the street, the people who are trying to supply food and medicine to everyone on the ground there. Describe kind of what those first couple of days were like and the sorts of things you were hearing and seeing from the folks on the ground. Well, the when we first got there, you know, you, you just, you know, as a journalist, you, you try to meet as many people as you can to try to understand what's going on on the ground. And at the, the time that we got there, it was the, it was the day after they had uh, burned the 
the third precinct in Minneapolis. And so uh, things were still at a fever pitch. And we, everyone in the world was pretty much seeing, you know, the, the, the burning and, and the looting and um, somewhat sensationalizing the things that were happening on the ground. And so we wanted to get an idea of, of what was going on behind the scenes. And, and we found this, this restaurant that, was, that served as a headquarters of a complex network of resources that that had the specific objective of supporting the people that were out in the field and they had they knew exactly what was going on when where and who people in the in in the community of minneapolis could call them and and ask for supplies whether they were were participating in the protest or whether they just needed you know groceries because as you can imagine when something like that is happening in a city, like grocery stores are boarded up, you know, uh, gas stations are boarded up. And so there are people who needed diapers. There are people who needed, you know, water. There are people, you know, who needed just things for everyday life. And these folks had coordinated themselves in a matter of days to, to supply the citizens of Minneapolis, including the protesters, with what they needed during this crisis. And what does that say about the demonstrations themselves? Not only that, but the way that we have started to dissect these demonstrations as they have spread across the country, there have been a lot of conversations around looting and the criminality and the level of violence or uh, the level of aggression by the demonstrators. And oftentimes I think what gets lost in those conversations is kind of understanding the role that the police play in these demonstrations escalating as well. You know, you were in the middle of, as you put this nexus of supplies that were mobilized almost overnight in order to allow people to be able to safely continue to demonstrate. Walk me through, you know, what the narrative was like on the ground versus the narrative that we were all watching from our couches on the evening news. Yeah, you see, you see, <laughs> you see the, the, the tear gas and the rubber bullets flying. Um, and I think it's interesting to note that there, there seem to be different arms of, of the protests, right? You mentioned, you know, the folks marching in the streets with their signs and, and, and the chants. Uh, there were some pretty creative chants, by the way. Like, I was, I was pretty <laughs> impressed. Uh, and you have um, what, you know, the destruction of property. Then you have, you know, what people say call, call looting, right? And I think people try to invalidate the the last two right the destruction of property like i was we were there on the ground and we saw you know folks breaking into a wells fargo bank and you know destroying the atms outside and on first first look even for myself like i have to be honest i i and even in the piece i i said that it seemed to be the antithesis of what the spirit of this demonstration is supposed to be but then on second thought i had to check myself because this 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 rage is is deeply rooted in in systemic racism, and people see, you know, the corporate infrastructure like a Wells Fargo bank being woven into the very fabric of that systemic racism, and so it could be, you know, look at these, as as you know, as some leaders have put it, look at these thugs, right? But it's not really what 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 I saw, and after you know, some, some further thought was put into it. And even when it comes to, to the looting, um, we've seen videos of, of, of folks discussing, you know, what's underneath that, right? We live in a capitalist society where, you know, you walk down the street and if you feel like from a bus stop to a subway sign to billboards, people are screaming at you to buy this, buy this, buy the new iPhone, buy these new, new, new shoes, buy, you know, um, and the stuff is not, it's, it's, some folks aren't in a position to to live the lifestyle that is being projected on us, right? To 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 live. And so if I have an opportunity to to acquire something that the world is telling me that I should have in order to feel significant in this space and I can't afford it and I have this opportunity to get it, I'm going to take advantage of it, right? And and I'm not saying that's right or wrong, but people have to understand the nuances of it. It's not just necessarily some folks out there trying to trying to take advantage of an opportunity um, that's been presented on on you know from 
from the death of a, of a black man at the hands of the police? I would go as far as saying when we are all subject to the trappings of the American dream and success, what success means and what it looks like in this country, there is nothing more American than seizing the opportunity to grab those assets for yourself and take them for yourself. There is nothing more, more American. That is the American way is seizing an opportunity once it presents itself to you. And, then, and sometimes the American way is not even if it presents itself. It's like, we just gonna take it, right? Exactly. And I think I, agree. I think a lot of this kind of distracts from the narrative of what is attempting to be communicated here. And it it is nothing happens in a vacuum. We are demonstrating against police brutality and the brutalization of black and brown bodies in this country. But also this is a response to generational oppression and disenfranchisement on the side of black and brown people in this country. I'm curious from your, where your perspective is, not only as a journalist, but as a black man, how do you engage with the way that people have tried to shift the focus or shift the narrative of these demonstrations and what people are trying to communicate right now? Well, I think as a, as a journalist, it's, it's important in that we play a significant role in what the narrative is, right? Because, um, when we're there on, on the ground, obviously as a journalist, you try to be as objective as possible, but just by virtue of you choosing to cover this thing and not this thing, you know, is, is you being subjective to a certain extent. And for us, it was important to, to see behind the scenes in order to, to not, not destroy the narrative that, you know, other media platforms were pushing because it was, it was, you know what we're what we were seeing by other media platforms was happening right so it's not that we are are ignoring it or trying to erase it but as a journalist um it's important it was important for us for me and my team to see and to show that it's all not doom and gloom right these people these people are organized like minneapolis minneapolis was extremely organized these folks had um, block captains that they had organized long before these protests even occurred. And so they were taking advantage of the infrastructure that they've already put in place in order to facilitate the support of what they see, what they saw needed to happen, you know? And the second part of your question, as, as a black man, um, it was particularly interesting to, to, to cover this. And as I said earlier, I, I haven't really had the time to, to process it all the way, but it was important for me to show and give these young people, especially the young people, a platform to, to express themselves in a way that they haven't been able to before and in a way that other platforms won't show. I talked to a very, very intuitive and um, uh, smart young woman um, and she was you know I was I, I said you know look these people are you know destroying property and she said look we've been having this conversation for a long time and if we have to get violent we have to get violent you know and and, and history has shown that people will respond when you get bucked you know, when you when you when you turn up a little bit, I mean, let's get real. One one young one young man said um, they would not listen to us unless we were out here stepping. Those were his words. Unless we were out here doing what we're doing, they wouldn't listen to us. It just it just they would just continue with with the rhetoric and, and nothing would come of it. And so this is what we were forced to do. So essentially they're saying it's not it's not our fault that we're out here doing this. If you had listened some 40, 50 years ago, guess what? We'd be chilling. And this is not the first time we have seen demonstrations like this uh, escalate to this level. It, you can look back in history, pretty far back in American history, but if we wanna consider contemporary moments, this happened in Detroit in the 60s, this happened in Watts in the 60s, this happened in LA in the 90s, this happened not too long ago in Baltimore uh, with the murder of Freddie Gray, and this happened in New York. Um, 
And we're seeing it happening again. And I think something that does often get lost in the narrative when we look at these types of demonstrations is the role that the police play in their escalation. I think my personal perspective is that there is a very clear and violent message being sent to the public by the police when they are opposing men, women, and children who are carrying signs and wearing surgical masks because we're still in a pandemic uh, mm. when they're flanking them with riot shields, batons, you know, helmets, standing in, using military tactics, standing rank and file. What is your perspective of that? Seeing this kind of uh, demonstration met with a level of force that far exceeds the one on, on the part of the public. Yeah, that's a that's a very good point. Um, it's interesting. There there were a few moments um, where I was I was in the field and I I'm looking at these riot police and in this gear and it made me think about when I was in middle school and like I played I played football tackle football in middle school and I just remember. Um, the psychological the psychological confidence that that was was directly attached to me putting on this uniform and being a part of a group of people who were going out to a into onto a field right to compete right and there was there was a sense of invincibility there's a sense of like oh we about to kick some ass right and and i think it's not a direct parallel, but there are some strong similarities there. When you look up and you see a, a solid wall of riot police officers that look like stormtroopers, you can't identify their face. Like you, you can't. And, and in some cities, they're covering their their badge numbers and their names, right? And so, and they're supposed to be, and they claim that they're supposed to be there to keep the peace but the protesters show up and their intention is to be peaceful the protesters show up they don't have batons they don't have sidearms they don't have shields they don't have um, um guns to shoot rubber bullets they don't have tear gas and tear gas yeah you know what i'm saying and so let's look at let's look at it from from the perspective of if you are here to keep the peace, then why are you bringing tools that are not peaceful? And and even as a journalist, like we had we had vests, we had gas masks, and we had helmets, but we didn't go out there with those things on initially. We had them ready at our disposal if we needed them to, but we didn't go out there wearing them because just by virtue of you having it on, it suggests that you're expecting something to go down, right? And we didn't want to be responsible for inciting something that was never gonna happen in the first place, but clearly it did, right? And so I, there is, I feel like if you're a police officer and you already have this, this sense of, uh, of immunity, like you're, uh, you're, you're immune, yeah, go ahead. I mean, it's I can talk no, about. I it. was just gonna say us versus them. It seems like you are you are presenting. We are either on the offense and they are on the defense, or vice versa. But we are not all here together in this moment. Right, right. And so, if you, if it's about keeping the peace, then let's keep the peace. I have uh, a buddy of mine who was on the ground the the night of the burning of the third precinct and he was across the street at Target and he you know he shared a video with me um, where he was recording and he said people were standing on the street peaceful and the police officer said that they were there to guard the property there was a fence around the property already so his question was if you're there to guard the property then why are you on this side of the fence? Just be on the other side of the fence, right? Why do you have officers up on the roof with with um, with weapons for rubber bullets in case something goes down? No, you know, to me, if if you if you look like you're going to be an aggressor, then 
even subconsciously, the person that is wants to be peaceful is like, oh, I, this is what we're doing. Oh, oh, you you came to you came to ready to fight. I wasn't gonna fight, but now making me think about being aggressive. You know. And that's interesting that you bring up that point and thinking about what's going to happen later in the hour uh, at 4.30. We're going to be joined by two more guests to have a great conversation about reform in law enforcement as these conversations are now be bring, being brought to the forefront of America's consciousness. But I'd like to think about the language from the highest office in the country. We're hearing words like dominate. We are hear seeing words like thugs and, and rhetoric from racist sheriffs of the past, how have you sort of responded to this administration's take on these demonstrations as opposed to even just those demonstrations around reopening the country some weeks before this? Uh, how have you engaged with that rhetoric, seeing you know our president, what I'm going to call inciting violence against protesters, peaceful protesters in DC, wanting to take a photo op at a church he had never really been to, uh, mm -hmm. insulting Mayor Bowser for painting Black Lives Matter on 16th Street, a street I lived on when I was growing up. Tell me about what role you think that has played in the, in the country's response to these demonstrations. You know, Lee, um, you asked me how I responded to it. To be honest, when I was in Minneapolis, I was kind of, uh, it was like a black hole, if you will, you know, uh, and I knew, you know, that rhetoric from from the president is not surprising uh, from from the time he's been in office. You know, that rhetoric has is, has kind of been uh, a mainstay for him and like that's his default disposition. And, I, you know, it, it, it seems as if I, I definitely agree with you that 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 rhetoric incites violence and, and aggression. And it doesn't it doesn't help in terms of healing this wound that this wound that has been been reopened again and again time and time um and for me i think i just try to as a journalist i'd like to try to tune it out but it's 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 pretty it's damn near impossible to tune it out you know uh it angers me just as a as a as a human being as a citizen of the United States, in that it um, it it has diminished the 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 dignity of the office. You know his Twitter fingers are pretty much out of control at this point, and even folks on his side, you know, some Republicans are like, "Bro, can you just shut the f up?" You know, um, and to me, it's 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 him. It's a it's a desperate reach for him to to maintain his base because we all know there's an election coming up right and COVID-19 has been rough for him these protests have been rough for him and you see he's organizing rallies you know nobody loves a pet rally more than than Trump right to 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 try to reinvigorate his base and so I just I stay I stay tuned because I'm a journalist, but just as a citizen of the United States, it's it's um it can be it could be it could be draining. What's interesting in this moment, I think, is the role that we as journalists and the media play in kind of being the stewards of this moment as we look back on it in history. Previously, I think we were never really in a position as a nation to have a more honest view of these types of moments. We had to take what the media gave us because everyone didn't have a camera in their pocket. And now that's changed. And now we can see, thanks to the internet and social media, there are videos of these protests being peaceful and then turning violent on the side of police. And now we're even seeing uh, counter protesters who are antagonizing peaceful demonstrations. Mm -hmm. Did you encounter any of that in Minneapolis? I didn't. I didn't encounter uh, many counter protesters. Um, I heard about them. I heard about them uh, from from some of our contacts that there were some white supremacists that uh, that were on the property of the headquarters, and I heard that some 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 shots were fired. But 
I'm not in a position to, to verify that information, but I didn't, I didn't see it directly, but I heard that there were counter protesters present in Minneapolis, but we've seen it across the country for sure. And as we look forward, because these demonstrations uh, have captured America's attention, and President Obama said last week that he believes the country has more of an appetite for change now and a stomach for progression than they did during the civil rights era in the 60s. What do you think the follow through from these demonstrations will look like? And as we start to have these conversations around defunding or abolishing police departments, where do you see this moving? Well, I definitely uh, agree that that people are hungry and thirsty for change. And there are a number of conversations being had about what that change looks like. And I think most people would agree that the um, the protests in the street, right, there, there's only, there's only, there's only so many protests that you can have in the street. Like you're not going to, to be in the streets with these numbers that we've been seeing for an extended period of time, right? Every day, there's not going to be 50,000 people, 100,000 people marching down the streets of, of LA, right? And so right. there, there, there needs to be a transition of that passion and that rage into some um, strategic mechanism to facilitate the 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 long term solutions, right? And so, um, one of the one of the things that uh, you mentioned early in the introduction, um, the documentary that we did in Charlotte, Black South Rising. So in 2016, there was the police killing of Keith Lamont Scott in Charlotte, North Carolina. And there were protests in the street. And one of the leaders of the protest ended up running for city council at large and he won. And so the voters largely voted out the, the old white guard and voted in young black and brown city council folks. And the, the mayor, they elected a black mayor. They have a black sheriff, a uh, black DA, city planner is black. and so Charlotte right now is somewhat of a real life example of what happens when, when folks take their rage from the streets to the ballot box. And I'm not saying that the ballot box is the only space where the transition from the streets um, to something tangible that's long lasting can, can exist, but those folks are trying to figure out how to um, dismantle uh, the long lasting um, effects of systemic racism of a city that was literally built on segregation because Charlotte is the second largest banking city in the country. And so they have a lot of money and they have the black leadership, but combined, do they have the willpower to kind of remedy some of the inequities that have existed? Only time will really tell and, and whether or not these these steps continue on in this country uh, remains to be seen. Something else that we've noticed is the international response in this moment, how uh, mm. demonstrations have broken out in London, they've broken out in Germany. What has been your, your reaction to seeing the world kind of take an interest and take note of systemic racism that extends beyond America's borders? Absolutely, I've been, I've been really impressed at how far this movement has, has reached and and it's just a testament to, you know, America, we all know is, is built on the foundation of, of racism. Um, but racism is not just limited to the United States. It's, it's interesting because I have friends in, in, in Europe that, you know, like to, like to roast America for our problems with race. But, you know, they need, to, they need to look themselves in the mirror. And this time is one of those times where People are out in the streets and recognizing that this problem with race exists beyond the borders of America, and people aren't just protesting in support of what of the justice movement here in America. They're protesting because they have their own issues in their country. You know. Yeah, I think it's going to be really interesting to see the way that this plays out, being that we are in an election year, uh, and seeing the actionable steps that we 
as a people are going to take and trying to form a more perfect union. But um, in thinking about those conversations and in thinking about reform, uh, I'm going to kick it over to you, Alzo. I know we're going to move into our next segment here and be joined by a couple of new guests to start continuing these conversations about follow through and what that's going to look like. Absolutely. And I hope you uh, stick around so maybe we have after. I'll be here. Yeah. So um, speaking of what happens after the protest, um, we are joined by two very special guests that I'm, I'm grateful to have with us. First, we have Michael Denzel Smith. He is a writer, TV commentator, and author of New York Times bestseller, Invisible Man, Got the Whole World Watching. And we are also joined by Professor Jacqueline Helfgott. She's a professor and director of Seattle University's Department of Criminal Justice, Crime and Justice Research Center. She serves on the Seattle Police Department's Crisis Intervention Committee. Let me say welcome to both of you all. How are you all doing today? Thank you. Doing all right. Thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you all for joining us. Um, just so you know, I know you guys uh, have been somewhat making the rounds and, and, and speaking about this issue, and this is the reason why we'd like to have you guys on. And for, for me, this is very, you know, it's a serious subject, but I treat it as, as, you know, this conversation is very informal. And I just want to start out by saying, you know, Michael, Jacqueline, we got a problem. We, we have a problem in America, and it's a problem that we we've had for, for quite some time, you know, and people just want to live. People just want to go outside. We want to just, you know, be able to, to live without, you know, being in fear of being killed by the police or, or being unjustly targeted and, and in prison. And there are a lot of conversations that are around, you know, defunding the police, reforming the police, abolishing the police. And I just want to have, you know, an honest and frank conversation with you all because you you all have been, you know, in this in this, you know, discussing this thing for quite some time. So I'd like to know of those three, um, where do you all fall? And if you can explain to me the position of where you all fall. And I'll start with with uh, Michael first. Uh, I'm an abolitionist um, and I come to that position because, you know, we're, we examine essentially what is the role of the police? What do police do in American society, right? And what's the history of policing? Um, and you, you, you trace it all the way back and you know, the world's first police department uh, being established, uh, the London Metropolitan Police. Uh, and they're, the entire reason is, that, you know, oh, sorry, getting phone calls. Um, the entire reason for the existence of that police department is to have a cheap alternative to the military to suppress uprisings in Ireland as they're fighting for independence. Um, so that's at the root of what policing is. And then you export that and that comes to the United States uh, and even its colonial days. Um, and it, what's established is one, the slave patrols in the South, uh, which are in charge of rounding up runaway enslaved people and then you have the police in the northern cities that are called in to suppress labor re rebellions, right? Like people who are saying, you know, we work, we earn low wages, we see our money going to the capitalist class, we are exploited, what have you. And they're saying that's wrong. And then they're, they're rebelling. And the capitalist class calls in uh, the armed guards that they hire to suppress those rebellions. That's, that's the root of what policing is in this country, right? And it hasn't really changed. It hasn't changed that, like the initial directive hasn't changed that much. It, police protect property, they protect wealth. They enforce the hierarchies of the, the US with regards to white supremacist, heteropatriarchal capitalism, right? Like they remind people of their station and they do so through the use of violence. But we also at some point uh, decided that police would be useful in the handling of crime 
And crime, though, is this broad category. Like it encompasses so many different things and so many different behaviors that get criminalized for different reasons, different like ideas of morality. Um, but not a, not it doesn't always have to do with like harm, have like act, people actually harming one another. But we're going to use the police to deal with crime. cruelty that's state sanctioned. I appreciate that clarification and explanation. So Jacqueline, let me let me throw to you and let you, you know, come in and join the party. What what out of reform, abolition and, and defunding, where do you stand? So I very much respect the um, position of police and prison abolitionists and the position of um, the proponents of the defunding the police uh, movement. Uh, everything Michael said just now, I just uh, agree with and, and the um, fact that we have to address the harms that have come from our existing systems. Um, you know, I guess the question, I mean, I, I've spoken out uh, against the defunding uh, movement. I it's actually not against the defunding movement at all. I think it, it, it uh, is a matter of how people are defining defunding. Um, you know, m my concerns are, and, and I guess I actually want to start to po pose a question uh, first, and because I've been asking myself as I've been speaking uh, uh, out on this, but but how do we acknowledge the 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 racist past and present? Um, you know, r racism in the system, the history of white supremacy in policing in the criminal justice system, while at the same time building on the reforms that have been put in place in recent years in many cities under consent decrees. Um, you know, how do we, I think you uh, mentioned in the previous segment, uh, also the, how, the strategic mechanisms to move uh, forward and 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 you know I I would suggest that um, you know major reforms are underway in many places in Washington State our Washington State Criminal Justice Training Commission head by Sue Rar, uh who was on Obama's 21st Century Task Force for Policing has uh, implemented a guardian oriented training program to take over the warrior oriented training we have in Seattle Chief Carmen Best is a um, you know, uh, uh, a, a black female police chief who, in response to the the protests, I mean, there was at first the, you know, the militaristic fronting of the police, and then she, you know, who, by the way, she was a police chief that was supported by the community. She was also supported by a group called Not This Time, led by Andre Taylor, whose brother Che Taylor, Taylor was killed by the police here in Seattle. She is a police chief of the community who has been listening to the community, and in the middle of the protests, she uh, has stated that she would be willing to fight 
she wanted to fight peace with peace. And we're in a situation, you know, here in Seattle where, you know, they've, a group of, of, of protesters have taken over an area of the city and they've uh, graffitied over the police station where it says that instead of the police station, it says the people's uh, station. And then Trump just tweeted, I guess today or yesterday, that if the, the mayor and the governor don't take back Seattle, he said, take back your city now. If you don't do it, uh, I will. And so there are still elements elements of culture that, you know, that, uh, so I guess the point I'm trying to make is, you know, major reforms are underway, police culture is changing, and we need the police to work in conjunction with these other, um, you know, services, uh, elements uh, that many of the defending proponents are um, speaking about in order to, to strategically make the change moving forward. So that's a question I would just like to pose. How do we do that? And can we do that with existing practices in place, uh, existing reforms in place? Can we move forward? So, so thank you for that, Jacqueline. So just really quickly, just a, a, a quick um, counterpoint to you, Jacqueline. It, it, you mentioned that there are significant there are reforms that are in place in Seattle. They've been there for, for quite some time. And, I, and would it be safe to say if we ask the people that were protesting in the streets of Seattle, if these reforms are working, they would say no. And this is the I reason why, we, why we're out here. And so if, if, if Seattle is supposed to be, you know, the model for what the rest of the country should pattern itself after, that, that may be... Uh, oh, yeah. Can I say, so I think we need to acknowledge that Seattle police and all police have a racist past and racist present. In, 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 I'm not suggesting that the reforms have, I mean, if, if anybody in America, if, 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 if people of color and black Americans have to be afraid of the police, we're nowhere near, near where we need to be. And yeah. um, the only point I um, am, am I'm putting that that is any different from the defending proponents that I um, would like to put forward is can we use the existing reforms under the consent degree the decree the uh, reform initiatives put forth in in the 21st century task force on policing the de-escalation training the crisis intervention training um, can we use what we have to move forward let's talk about it so so Michael so Jacqueline is saying hey look the system is messed up. There's there's racism, systemic racism throughout. You know, the po police force. He agrees with you that um, the, the the historical foundation is 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 cracked. And with regard to how we've gotten to the place where we've gotten, she we said, "Hey, but can we can we just we, we got some stuff in place that we're that that's starting to work already? Can you just can you just meet us there and work with us instead of just getting rid of the police entirely?" Why? <laughs> like, like, why? I don't like if if, Do you want, okay. if, the, if the thing doesn't work. If the thing just had like, this is my thing. Uh, what do the police do in that situation, right? So if we talk about just just thinking broadly, okay, about five percent nationally, about five percent of all nine one one calls are about violent crime. Right, like one about one percent is about murder. That is, if we if we are to just for a minute, I take off my abolitionist hat and I say, look, yes, police could deal with violent things, right? Like that. That's five percent of all nine one one calls. That's ninety five percent where it's just just not about anything that has to do with violence. Where you may want a violent intervention, like you you think that that's necessary. So. What, why would the police be involved in any of those things? Why, can't, why, would it, why wouldn't it be better to, to uh, fund people who are already doing de-escalation work and have the, have the anti-violence uh, ideology already running through that? Why isn't it better to be able to, call, to have a suite of people to be able, and agencies to be able to call that don't involve policing, right? So there's, there's that. Like, why, not, why do police need to be involved there? And then the other part of it is when it comes to actual harm, 
police aren't preventing this from happening. Like the, the, the deterrent is not working in terms of like using the state sanctioned violence of the police officers to be able to prevent the murders from happening, to prevent the robbery from happening, to prevent the rape from happening. They are also, they're engaging in violent behaviors themselves, right? Uh, what, what are we trying to get out of it? It seems, and I would say that what really, what, what the police function as in that situation in which you've been harmed and you call the police is that you want harm done to the person that has perpetrated harm against you, right? Like you're, it's bloodlust. It is seeking revenge. The state, I don't believe, should be involved in revenge. It should be involved in justice, right? And that's something that's a different model than what we have currently. So, so then, Jack, Jacqueline, is it? Okay. I've, I've, read, I've read a number of articles about why the police should be defunded and why the police should be dismantled and abolished. But there are not many articles that say why the police are needed. Why, why would you say we need the police? Okay, so... Um there's a lot for me. So first of all, I'm very conscious of the fact that I'm a white woman in this conversation and I, I'm coming at this from this uh, perspective. But I'm also coming at it from a perspective of for many years, um, going on three decades, I, I, I've spent 20 years in the prisons, I, uh, you know, working on restorative justice in prisons. I spent time the next, you know, the latter part of my career in police agencies, seeing how police work together with mental health. Like, for, for example, so you asked the question, why do we need police? In the crisis intervention training that all police, for example, in Seattle have, we have an officer and a mental health professional that go out to incidents involving behavioral crisis. Behavioral crisis incidents can turn on a dime. We're not just talking about those 5% of violent crimes. We're talking about a whole range of issues when someone calls the police we don't, the police don't know what they're, they're going to a lot of times. So in Seattle, we have crisis flag calls, uh, sometimes, you know, where, where the police don't know what they're going to. And there's a set of calls where the mental health professional and the police officer will go out together. In the crisis intervention training, police have to go into scenarios where maybe somebody is holding a knife to somebody and they have to figure out how to deescalate that. It might be a scenario where there's a schizophrenic woman in a library where the police have to be asked to, um, remove her in a way that is a kind way and not using their militaristic uh, fronting. So when you ask me the question, why are police needed, my answer to that would be, I haven't heard, I, 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 would, I don't know that unless uh, mental health professionals and social workers are trained in the similar way that police are trained to deal with those on a dime, quick on a dime, a relatively benign incident could turn dangerous for everybody involved. Um, you know, th 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 unless th those people are trained in the same way police are, then I would not be comfortable saying there's no role for police. I, I see police working together with mental health professionals to de-escalate, to use a more restorative approach. Um, if you're telling me mental health professionals can go in, I would say they need to be trained in the way the police are trained. And then I would have to ask the question, well, then aren't you just training new people in, the same, in, in policing? So I guess the vision I would want to see is a way that police can be re-envisioned the same way that the defunding proponents and abolitionists although not taking it that far, can be, can be retrained to work together with these other um, you know, social service uh, uh, professionals in order to de-escalate and have a more restorative uh, system and a completely different way of doing things. I do agree we need to re-envision policing. So, so Michael, I'm going to have you respond to that, but also expanding on that from your position, Michael, you know, Two weeks ago, three weeks ago, the idea of defunding the police was would, was radical, right? And and the idea of abolishing police was just not thought of, right? I mean, besides, you know, a few people who have been doing this work for quite some time, I don't want to deny them their props, right, including yourself. But right now, you know, people are hearing the abolishment of the police for the first time and responding like, bro, what do you mean no police? Like, I, I get that, you know, there's some rotten apples in the police force, 
but to just get rid of them all together. So what is your response to that? In addition to what Jacqueline is saying in terms of police are being are needed to respond to certain situations. My response is it can be used to both. Like I, I think what what people hear when they hear abolish the police is re immediately removing police from our world right now as it exists, right? What abolishing the police is about is reimagining the entire world. It is a reimagining of every social structure, of, ev of all of our economic and political structures to understand that what, what we need to do to be mitigating the harm that we do see already has not been done. So we, like COVID-19 has revealed to us, like as we had to shut things down, it showed us what's what what is essential, right? Like what is essential to life? What is essential to people's safety and health? What what actually what, what the people actually need? And it's housing, it's food, it's healthcare, it's education, it's recreation, it's transit, all of these things that are essential to life that we haven't provided for everyone just yet. Right. So when you think about abolishing the police, you have to start there. You have to start with the level of inequality that already exists and say we're doing something about that, because so much of the behavior that we're attempting to like fix via police has to do with the fomenting of that social decay, decay in the first place. So the, the defunding of police, like as that becomes the call, is about saying we're taking that money and we're doing front end investment so that we're not even like so that we're not thinking about how many of those types of calls that Jacqueline is describing are actually going to going to have to take place because that person would have their medication. They'd have a system of care already in place that would that hopefully wouldn't lead to a breakdown. Now, that's the first part. The eventual harm that gets done because I'm not uh, I'm not in you know unrealistic. I don't think of, of uh, I'm not Pollyanna-ish. We're human beings. We will have conflicts. It may rise to the level of physical violence. It, it will harm, people will be harmed in, in certain instances, right? If you need that kind of intervention, I still don't see a role for someone that only has the tools of violence at their disposal. And it's exactly what you're saying, Jacqueline. Why do you need the police officer if you could train someone else in those tactics of de-escalation, someone that doesn't have a gun and is not given uh, the, the authority of the state to kill, right? Like that's what I'm saying is that there's a whole, there's a holistic reimagining of every system that has to take place that, that, that abolishing the police is centered around. It's saying we are, we are against the harm that is caused in our, in, in our communities or against the harm that is imposed upon our communities via these systems, the exploitation, the degradation, the humiliation, the violence. We're opposed to all of that. And we're looking for ways of undoing all of that and providing for people a just world in which those things are, are not as a front of mind concern for everyone and then figuring out ways that are nonviolent responses to harm that has been done. Mm -hmm. So it, it seems to me that uh, you guys aren't all that far apart as, as the titles would, would, would make it seem, right? <laughs> like, uh, of course, Michael, you, you want to eventually get to the point to where police are not needed. And Jacqueline, you want to engage in some reform. Now, so in that respect, um, we only have like nine more minutes. I wish we had more time, but um, there, Michael, there has to be, like you said, it's not just snap of a finger and flip of a switch and police disappear, right? And Jacqueline, you were saying earlier that there is systemic racism throughout law enforcement that needs to be remedied, right? So. Michael, you got you you got a beard, bro, right? I got a beard. And we all and we all we you and I know that in order to get to this part of the beard, it's, it's, it's ugly. The transition is ugly when you go from oh, bare face. Mine, mine is real ugly because this is quarantine. <laughs>
But what I'm saying is like <laughs> it there's some there's some steps to get from here to where Jacqueline is talking about and from where Jacqueline is talking about to where you are talking about, Michael. And Jacqueline, would it be safe to say, would you agree that you would like to live in a world where police are not needed? Yes, I would. I, I Well, I guess I would. So, I, I mean, my, my, can I say my concern? I know we only have a few minutes, but, but yeah. my concern, my, my concern is, if you look in the 1970s, there was an article came out by Robert Martinson about correctional rehabilitation in the United States. It turned into media and politics, turned it into nothing works in correctional rehabilitation, which ended up taking all the funding out of corrections and correctional rehabilitation. And it took a whole nother generation for people to recognize how that resulted in, in part, was that it resulted in mass incarceration. And my only, my concern is criminal justice is intimately tied to media and politics and when we've made gains and media and politics gets a hold of it those gains end up going backwards and that's my concern I want to go to the same place Michael wants to go to I, I, I what I see are good people many good people in policing many black police and command staff positions many women in policing who are doing work to change and have been trying to do it for a long time I don't want to lose that and my concern about defunding the police is that we will lose that that we will learn lose the mental health uh, officer partnerships we will lose the crisis intervention we will lose the guardian oriented training we will lose the accountability processes and the use of force policies and the transparency and everything that has come from the reforms in the agencies that have been able to make some small, uh, granted, steps at reform. Um, but I just want to take that as a building block and move forward. So, so Michael, would you, would you say that in, on the way to achieving the goal that you want of complete abolishment of police officers, would you say that on the way that some of these things that Jacqueline is talking about need to be put in place? Those are what get termed reformist reforms, right? Like it's just, it is still about the continued existence of the institution, right? Like it's saying, oh, we can make it better. We can make it function better. And what, I, what, what really like the abolitionist reforms are saying, you can just do away with it. Like you can take, instead of little steps, you could take bigger steps. So defunding is saying all of the stuff that you're talking about, Jacqueline, being funded, but it just doesn't involve police. Like it's just not about, like it's just not about, uh, it, it is about taking the carceral logic out of our way of thinking around how, how harm is done and how to deal with it so that we're not just saying the only way the only way has to involve some level of violent response, right? Like it's saying fund all of those other things so that we can get to it. And look, no one's saying it's neat and it look, doesn't look messy on the way there and that we don't mess up. Like that's, that's a given in any transitional period to something that's brand new and people haven't experienced before absolutely it's going to look like we're failing and you bring up the, the idea of like rehabilitation like people are writing papers and they're just like it doesn't work and it's like well you didn't give it any time you didn't give it any time to actually function you didn't change anything else around that and that's the thing mm -hmm. is if you are you are you you say, look, we're invested in something that is holistic, that we're saying we're changing every aspect of our society. We're, we're looking at the ways in which economic exploitation can be changed. I mean, just think of something that the like, very bit, like let's think about what brought us here to this moment in this discussion. George Floyd had the police called on him because he was accused of passing a counterfeit $20 bill. Now, this is, it obviously is illegal, right? But think about a system in which, because he has access to banking, because we have banking everywhere at post offices and everything, and is able to be issued a debit card very easily, and all of our, because most of our money dealings are digital anyway, we don't even have that, that, that as a thing, right? Like, that's just something to just think about, to be like, 
there's some there's other ways of doing all of this um and that's really what, what we're talking about is just saying there are other ways of doing this and we, there are steps that get taken obviously defunding is one thing moving money away from policing into other avenues decriminalization of so many things that are on the books already that are not harms that are not harming other people that are just simply like things that have been legislated for morality things that have been legislated for the idea of uh, protection of property the idea of uh, criminalizing homelessness and mental illness decriminalizing all of those things uh, eventual disarming of the police <laughs> like all of those are steps that we are yeah. taking that we would say to take to get to that world so um a lot to think about and as we as we close this out i just want to ask do you guys do you guys think this is just a moment for folks like you all who want to um you know either abolish the police or reform or defund do you think this is just a a, a quick moment that's getting a lot of shine because of the the um the attention i think that people have the 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 will to, to go the distance with it. So, so you know, uh, no, I don't think it's just a moment. I think this has been huge. Um, what what has happened? I think that we don't. Uh, dis Michael and I. I mean, I, I'm not disagreeing with a a anything that you're saying. Just how we get there. And I think that many people have been working in the criminal justice system for a long time to get to the place that police abolitionists, prison abolitionists are talking about, um, decriminalization, everything that you're talking about. And this will be a force. There's been a convergence of forces that have gotten us to this place. And this is going to be a huge force. Um, I really appreciate being part of this conversation. Um, you know, and, and I think this kind of dialogue uh, will get us to a place um, that's a much, I hope that's a, uh, that, that will get us to a place and this, what's going on now, I, th I, yeah. I think many people, including people in policing, um, uh, um, would agree that this will get us there yeah. faster. So Michael, let me ask you, are you, are you just in vogue now and you're going to be out of style in a couple of weeks or what? Depends on how many more police stations get burned down. <laughs> The word right there. <laughs> well, I want to thank both of you all for joining us in this conversation. I um, really appreciate the insights, and I've learned quite a bit. And I think it's important for people to see um, the connect and disconnect between, you know, defunding reform and abolition of law enforcement here in the United States. So thanks again for uh, participating, and I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. And now we're going to go back to my man, Lee. What's up, Doc? What's you, up, man? How are you? That was incredible. Are you listening in there? Were you, were you tuning I was, in? I, 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 listen, I hung around. I've been there. Um, I think there are a lot of really great points. I mean, I think it's difficult for me, and I'm just speaking for me, it's difficult for me to envision a world where we don't have police just because yeah. I've, I've never seen that before, right? I do, yeah. however, think that reform and defunding, I think the conversation, sometimes we need to remember that crime often is the language and the expression of inequality in real time. And when you arm people with the resources they need so that they don't have to steal to, rob their, uh, to feed their families, when they don't have to rob in order to pay the bills, um, we won't have as much of a need for the intervention of the police in this country. I mean, it doesn't make sense to me that we have police forces with armored vehicles in the same cities where schools don't have art programs or music programs. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. And I, I, I think what I found um, interesting about the conversation is the, the language, right? Because when people hear abolish, that's strong. I think slavery. I'm saying, yeah, exactly. You think slavery. You think of you completely get rid of it. And I think, you know, Michael is all for that. And he and he brought up some interesting points. And he even, you know, recognized that it's not gonna happen overnight, right? And that there, there needs to be 
things put in place to eventually get to that point. And I think that's the part of the abolitionist argument that the general public doesn't necessarily see. Because it's, it's when you hear abolish, it's like, we're done with police. And it's difficult to imagine that. But you can imagine, you know, step by step with the eventual objective of, of complete abolishment of the police and kind of diverting some of their responsibilities to other places which are funded from the money that was used to fund the police, you know? I can't agree more. And I think it's an interesting conversation because I've done a lot of work around policing and I've spent a lot of time talking to cops around the country. And a lot of them feel that we ask too much of the police. And I actually mm -hmm. agree with that. I think we should be arming more social workers with the ability to respond to emotionally distressed calls. Uh, I think we should have more people in place to deal with, you know, p potentially uh, a homeless person who is um, a danger to themselves or presenting a danger to others. And I think it shouldn't always be met with a police officer. Not every situation uh, requires that. And I also think it's really interesting to talk about the idea of potentially not, you know, throwing the police away completely, but increasing the amount of training that they get. Becoming a cop should be one of the more difficult things you can do in a society. There should not be a city where you need a thousand more hours of training to give someone a fade than you do to carry a weapon and be able to, to execute deadly force on someone. Yeah. No, no, you're, 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 I don't disagree at all with that. And it's, and it's when you, when you look at, you know, the points that Jacqueline was making, you know, she, she mentioned that she agreed with everything that, that Michael was saying. And it was interesting for her to, 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 to say that she would want to live in a world where the police are needed. Right. But she is not for that right now in real time but i think that the the biggest difference between the two of them for me was the goal of the abolitionists is to get there right right they, they want to get there the goal of of the reformers or the reformists is is that we we still need police but we just got to change some things up and would you, would you, let me ask you this, would you, how would you, how would you, as a black man, how would you feel if there were no police? To be honest, I think I might feel less safe because I know that doesn't correct inequality in this country. So I'm aware of the reason why people resort to crime in order to, it's a means to an end. It's not often, it's not always rather the tools of exploitation. It's not just someone trying to take advantage of a person or a people. And so my personal opinion is that we still need the police. We can't just get rid of the police. Society is not there because we don't have as much equality in society as I think we would need in order for the police to be more obsolete or less needed. So I think that's just okay. my perspective. Okay, so then the follow-up is, I know I'll put myself in, in this. Um, I'm not comfortable around the police. Yeah. And, and I'm not saying that they need to be completely abolished, but I've been conditioned just through life in general that I don't seek, I don't, the police aren't the first people that I, that I look to for, for help in a situation, right? And if I'm walking and I see a group of police officers, the thought crossed my mind to, to cross the street or find another way because I just don't, I just don't want to deal with it. And they, and, and they, they very well may be, you know, some good dudes or, you know, some, 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 great women of, of, of character, you know, but I don't want to, I don't want to take that chance because I'm walking and, and then something happens. And next thing you know, I'm on the ground with my hands behind my back and I was just going to the store to get, you know, a bag of chips. 
there's nothing more scary than being behind the wheel of a car and seeing those red and blue lights behind you. I mean, every time I've been pulled over, my heart beats out of my chest. I, I'm yes. the same way. I have, I avoid eye contact with the police, right? Like, I try not to. It, I'm not doing anything wrong in my daily life, but I'm I'm acutely aware of how I could meet my destruction at their hands at any given moment for any given reason. Um, and, so and let me I, ask, I agree with you. I let me ask you this, Lee. Um, and this may be this may be a tangent, but I think it's something worth worth discussing because we're two black men raised in America, and I know personally, and I've said this before um, in, in other interviews, that if I'm, if I'm engaged with law enforcement and I know that I'm in the right, they know that I'm in the right, but their ego like, doesn't allow them to concede. And so they're far, so far into it that they won't retreat into what they know to be right and they proceed to put their hands on me lee i have to say bro like that is a situation that i'm fearful of because i don't i don't think i could stand there and just let another human being put their hands on me and god forbid i'm with someone else and they put their hands on them like a loved one i'm not gonna make it lee i'm not gonna make it and so from your perspective and with regard to the conversation that we're having and reforming the police, defunding and abolishing them, how do you see yourself in, in circumstances like that? Yeah, I mean, um, I've been there. And uh, in those moments, you're completely powerless over your own life, right? And your own well-being and your body. You've lost all agency over your body at that moment, in that moment. Uh, not all, but most of it, right? And so I, I feel what you're saying in a very deep level, in a very real way, and I don't have the answer. I mean, yeah. body cameras have not made me feel more safe, right? Retraining the police has not made me feel more safe in those instances. All I know that I can do in those moments is try to present the, try to mitigate the amount of threat that I'm communicating to them but as you said, they're humans and they're men and women and they are not cut from any different cloth than I was. And ego is a very real thing. And so when you just wanna execute your will over someone and you wanna send them a message that I'm a cop, you can't talk to me however you wanna talk to me, I'm in charge here, uh, I don't know what to do other than, yeah, hopefully we don't have those actors in our police force anymore. Because what we are asking from the police, I think in this moment, is to be better people, right? Is to be better than the average person. Uh, have more patience, have better foresight, have better restraint. And unfortunately, we don't always have that. Yeah, I mean, this is this is a conversation that is not gonna end anytime soon. And and I really, I really do hope that you know folks that are feeling this way on both sides or just you know on both sides of the argument for police against police um i think I, I hope we have the the willpower to sustain this discussion when the motor the emotional rhetoric falls away right because um right now in large part people are being driven by emotion which is fantastic which is ama amazing but i'm not certain that emotion has the, the the strength and the and the juice to, to carry through the fight that's necessary to reach some of the goals that people have discussed today. I agree with you. Uh, and Alzo, I, I really appreciate you taking out the time to do this, to moderate that conversation so, uh, so well, so elegantly. And um, for everyone who tuned in, thank you for being here with us. Yep, appreciate it. And, um, you know, we'll be back soon. Thank you, guys.